Hello, welcome to the Now Man Show. I am Now Man, the superhero of the present moment. What are you thankful for? For life, for every moment, for um, uh, waking up every day with a sense of gratitude, for um, being able to absorb the frequency of every single moment, um, for the love of my, my wife and family, for the friendships that I have. Um, thankful for love. That's fantastic. I'm here with Michael James Casey. And Michael, what are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my family, my, my wife, my uh, two sons, uh, my brother. Uh, for me to be an artist, for me to live my dream. I say dare to dream, dare to live the dream. And you're going to have ups, you're going to have downs, and you're going to doubt yourself sometimes. And to have a family support system, uh, that core group, uh, their love and support, and say, yeah, continue to be who you are, be the artist you are destined to be. I'm so thankful for because everything else that's come my way uh, wouldn't have been possible. And even if it is possible, I don't think I'd enjoy it nearly enough without my family. Hello, this is Nice Wander of the Now Man Show, and I'm here with Kyle Salazar, who is a writer, director, producer, cinematographer, social media maniac, and so much more. And he has, along with his production team, which calls themselves the High Five Collective, and we'll talk about them later, have produced basically non-official music videos and also worked with Frank Ocean, the band Neighborhood, and more. But right now he is working on his first full-length feature, which is about vervet monkeys in the Limpopo province of South Africa. So first, let's watch a trailer. Check it out. They always say that the vervet monkey population is increasing. We say no, it's not increasing, it's increasing in urban areas because you keep chopping down all of their forest. All the way to Palabura you can see monkeys. There's no peace and they come in, in boards, you know, raid everything in the garden, you come into the house, they have fights. I can't shoot this bastard. You killed 25 last week? Yeah, of course, man. I you don't think that's a bit cruel? I'm not cruel. That's the thing as well with the, the velvet monkeys, they're like the straw that breaks the camel's back in the sense of the Afrikaans people are in a, in a country that was run by them and now isn't run by them. They're trying to make money off of farming and maybe they have a bad year and they don't make much money and then the monkeys turn up and they're like right that's the only thing I can take out my aggression on so I'm going to go shoot a monkey. Inevitably it's human error that causes most problems with animals. They're cutting down the forest, they're cutting down everything, not for people to eat, to feed the cattle, to feed people. You know, we take responsibility for like a really small part of our lives, but you know, our lives project outwards. In the scientific community, there's kind of an acceptance now that these monkeys have feelings. It's ridiculous for someone to work here for a month, two weeks, a day really, and not see that they have personalities. You can't put two monkeys in the same situation and have them act the same. The traditional beliefs mingling in with you know, capitalism and trying to create wealth, blah, 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 it's a mess. Mar, there are other people, if you ask, he can tell you the monkeys is the witch. The hands of yeah. monkeys uh -huh. are used to cure the small children. Mm -hmm. 
this is like the new world, basically. I mean, you know, I know they refer to as the third world, but I mean, they're developing. These are countries that haven't been developed and you are developing. Surely, there should be some idea about developing it properly. Every year, it becomes more and more vital that these type of areas are preserved and looked after. And it becomes more and more difficult to look after. We need to protect endangered species. That's part of our heritage. If you don't protect your heritage, you don't have future. There has to be a change and shift in human attitude at some point. We really need to try and live with our neighbours. People must just accept each other, because changing culture is not easy. I think when you get back to nature and you start seeing things from that side, um, you look at the world very differently. You can never be able to coexist with animals and uh, human habitation 100%, but at least try and keep what you can. Kyle Salazar, thank you for being on The Now Man Show. Thanks, man. So, tell me, what did we just see? What is this movie about? <laughs> this movie is about so many things, but in particular, it focuses on this species of monkeys called the vervet monkey. And they're pretty pre prevalent um, throughout Africa, but I've chosen to focus on this population in South Africa. And that's because there's this uh, rehabilitation foundation for the monkeys called the Vervet Monkey Foundation. And they actually take in orphan monkeys, monkeys that have you know, been captured and sold as a pet that then get rescued from being a pet because the people can't handle a monkey anymore. Mm -hmm. Or you know, a monkey that's been hit by a car or shot or caught in a snare of barbed wire. All different sorts of stories, even down to baby orphan vervets who are like few week old newborns who've had um, their mothers killed by those same means and the babies have nowhere to go so this foundation takes them in and that's sort of where the film's central focus is it's on these this group of orphan baby vervet monkeys and it follows them through the first six months of their life we see them learn how to literally walk and talk monkey language, but talk and drink from a bottle and eventually eat solid foods. And we watch them you know, learn how to climb and then interact with each other and then other monkeys in troops. And meanwhile, this is all being facilitated by local African staff members and volunteers who come from all around the world. And then in the end of this simplistic, beautiful story is this heartwarming resolution where these baby vervets are introduced to foster mothers, which are female mother vervets, established members of troop hierarchies on the foundation. And these babies are then raised for the rest of their life by these mothers and actually get a family structure to live in for their lives. So they go from being these like terrified little babies who have just been either like hit by a car, let's say, and they end up at this place knowing nobody, knowing nothing, and end up then six months later being with moms and getting a life. So I sort of use this story, this view, this very humanizing view of these animals as a catalyst for a much broader conversation regarding lifestyle sustainability, um, you know, the ideologies behind uh, cultural oppression, and a lot of topics regarding sort of how we look at animals and how we look at one another and especially when it comes to the ideas of like, I guess you could call it speciesism. That would be the term to call it. Speciesism is something that's like a very serious issue and I think that throughout history we've never thought about animals as something that's worth anything more than an economic value or like an adorability factor. And so when you start looking at animals is something that's greater than just another species where we go, oh, well, if it's not a human, it's not really worth anything. 
then you start to kind of look at these things differently. And I, I think that in a country that's been wrought with so much racism and so much violence for hundreds and hundreds of years, where the majority of the population has just been bashed and diminished continuously, it's really important to bring up the topic of why. Why do we treat each other the way that we treat each other? And how does that methodology reflect and then you know, rebound into our daily lives? And how does it affect others around us? And how does it affect the way that we go about the things that we do and the way that we're influenced to purchase and to consume and to help? You know, because you think about these animals and you think about them and you say, well, it's an animal. It doesn't right. have economic value. It's right. a cute thing, something. But you think about people and it's like, we will do anything to save human lives. We're so adamant about saving human lives, you know? From people that are born with certain handicaps to someone who loses a limb, someone who's starving. Someone else will always be out there like, you know what, like these people deserve a chance to live. But throughout time, so many fewer voices have stood up and been proponents of animals having that same sort of like, necessity of life. And it's funny to think about because you look at the average human being and how much benefit does the average human being actually give to the earth? How yeah. much benefit does the, actu yes. the average human being actually you know, put out there so that there's a progressive change happening that creates some sort of movement toward goodness, toward lifestyle sustainability, toward realistic endeavors that allow, you know, a progression of love and enjoyment. So much of human life is wasted away purely on an economic fantasy reality lifestyle. And, and the system that we are a part of, you know, in the case of the, the Vervet Monkeys, I mean, part of the, the Monkey Foundation, it's called the Vervet Monkey Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Or the VMF. The for VMF, short. for yeah. short. Yeah, and is the, the, the economic, or shall I say, the ecological, uh, uh, role that the monkey actually plays, like even in the natural environment, like it, it mentions something about the seed germination and the yeah. food uh, dispersal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the monkey. And then they, they realize that, exactly, and that that's part of the the, the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, yeah. is that and you go into that in the film and mm -hmm. the importance of that and connect it to the role that human beings play in all this, as well as other animals. Because yes. what you're talking That's, about is And we're looking monkeys. at one species, right? right? One animal of one. Well, it's easier to focus on it, one topic, yeah, and it's yeah. more accessible for the average person to want to watch, or any person to want to have their attention invested on one thing that they care about. And what's more fun to watch than a baby animal? And the baby monkey, nonetheless, that's going through a story, if you can draw some sort of intellectual comparisons that can be given to the average person who does not indulge in scientific entertainment, Right. then suddenly right. they're going to be learning something just by enjoying themselves. And I think that's the massive message that I'm trying to profess is that that's the element of current social media that I think is weak and that needs to have the biggest change is that, and when I say social media, I mean all media throughout history. It's yes. always sort yes. of, um, it's always sort of pushed forward people that don't necessarily do anything. That's right. <laughs> They're just sort of like, they have a product, they have something to sell, and that's cool. Right. But like, there has to be a point beyond cool. There has to right. be a point where everybody's not just trying to be cool. And right. there has to be a point where it's like, no, but what about like, what you're doing? Like yeah. how, what, what, like think about your impact. Think about your responsibility as like a creature that's living and surviving. Like we are very destructive and careless and we really focus on ourselves because we allow elements of our lives to just compact down on us and become the most like overwhelming aspects of any aspect of the day. Every breath can become labored because of some minutia that occurred between an interaction of uh, disagreement. And it's like, but wait, there's so much more going on than these like ridiculous parodies of life that we throw each other into. Yeah, and what, how, explain how the, the, the Vevet 
vermin. Vervet yeah. monkey. It's, it's really easy to get that yeah, confused, right, with vermin. And yeah, because, exactly. Because technically there was that element to it, too. Oh, right? they've always been considered a vermin. Yeah. It's kind of funny that their name is so similar to vermin, uh, vermin, it? vervet, but they're not vermin. And that's the issue. Exactly. Is like they do have an important role in the ecosystem, like all animals. You know, I was reading a book today and just kind of brushing up for this, and it was it's called The Conservationists and the Killers. And it's all about um, conservationists versus killers in South Africa from you know, the founding of the country throughout the years. And in the early 1920s, the 1910s, conservation was this huge discussion. Because f before that, for the past like 200 years, they had just been killing yes. everything. Right, right. And it was funny to look at the way that they approached conservation. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they looked at the giant herds of game. Mm -hmm. And they killed all these game, and then suddenly it was like, no, there's no game left, we have to preserve them. So they began to preserve the game, set up little places for the game to live, reserves, things like that, on farms, and they started increasing the population. But then they also started saying, well, we need to have our cows grazing. And so at all times, there was always some sort of animal that was considered a vermin because they were either detrimental to the grazing of the cows or livestock, and then they were detrimental to the big game. And you know, yeah. obviously, a lion is detrimental to both of those things. A right. leopard is detrimental to both of those things. Right. And so early on, those were very much so considered pests. Yeah. And you think about that today, and you're like, mm, wait a second, like a lion and a leopard being a pest, that's just silly. Like, no one would consider them a pest these days. Like, that's an important heritage. It's an important cultural icon. It's like, why would you think it's a vermin? It's like, well, because it had an adverse effect against human growth. It would do things. It would attack people. And it made people say, oh, well, we don't. We don't want this around us because it kills things that we need to survive. And humans are the ones that, that came up with this concept of entitlement and ownership. Exactly. So it's like, you know, we're encroaching on, on the, uh, the territory of the natural environment. Right. So how can we look at these creatures as getting in our way? Right. Because you know, we're aren't super we getting in their though. way? Well, because we're you know? super predators. And right. if you look at anything from yeah. that perspective of like, the knowledge that we are predators mm -hmm. and that we are also bacteria that are just proliferating as quickly as we possibly can, then it's no wonder that we're so good at it. I mean, we are specializing our lives in order to be able to procreate with ease. Right. And right. so we always want to do everything that's going to benefit ourselves. Now we're getting to this point in our consciousness where I feel as if we're understanding, hey, maybe everything else around us actually plays a role and it's not just about us like exploring because you look back then and you look at the way the world was set up and going to America from Europe before America yeah. was discovered was like you know going to the moon it was right. crazy you had right. to travel across this vast sea for months years who knew what was yes. going to happen people yes. would die you get illnesses things were crazy but now the world's so small right we've prob probed and prodded to a point of like you know, near boredom. Right. And right. we're going, okay, well, now we've created this entirely artificial universe called the internet. Yeah. Nothing's really that scary <laughs> or foreign anymore. Right. If you get out there and you right. explore a little bit, like you can get around easy, you can communicate easily. What are we doing? Like what, right. if we haven't gone there and we're still here and this is all we know and this is all we have, then like this whole mentality of vermin and like bad for humans needs to change. Yeah, and, and the thing that is, you're talking about the internet being uh, you know, artificial, yeah. but a lot of truth is coming through the internet that, well, not that, that, would, not, that would not... It's real, it's there, it's it, a reality. It, it's, there. it's tangible through a medium, and that's how all things are. I mean, reality is only tangible through the medium of our senses. The right. internet's only tangible through the medium of a, of a CPU. Right, exactly, exactly. But, I mean, it's, it's a reality, but sorry, what were you no, saying? No. <laughs> well, the internet is, is a tool now, people consider yeah. it as a tool, so you can actually, it's an artificial mechanism, you could say, man-made, yeah. where the truth can now be uh, mm -hmm. disseminated from. You know what I mean? And more of it and an immediate. Well, individual truths can be obtained through other people. And right. there's no, that's not right. going to be an right. immediate truth. But you can find right. a variety of information. And with a amalgamation of information, you can then formulate a greater truth for yourself that that's helps right. you guide yourself in a way that feels now, better to yourself. And, and because of, in the topic of, of the animals and the ecology now, we, we are seeing a growing awareness of, of how to change our lifestyles and start to transition yeah. back to kind of the way it used to be in ancient times, um, in, in many ways. 
we're seeing people becoming more vegetarian, people are becoming more vegan, they're becoming more aware of, of animal issues. And it's, and it's through the, the, really the man-made concept of animal rights. Uh -huh. It's the reality of the fact that these are living, breathing creatures. Uh -huh. you know, and even through the theory of mind, uh -huh. that it can be determined that these creatures are like humans in the sense that they do have feelings, okay. they do have empathy, yeah. they are very deep. I mean, when I was watching that trailer, uh, the uh, looking in the eyes of those monkeys, it just pulled me in. Like, yeah, totally. You see so much depth in those eyes. Yeah. Yeah. If you can look into its eyes and feel something, you immediately feel some sort of camaraderie, some sort of compassion, and then suddenly you have something with that animal. Suddenly you're there, you know? The theory of mind, I found this on Wikipedia, there's an interesting definition. It's the ability to attribute mental states, uh, beliefs, intents, desires, pretending, knowledge, etc., to oneself and others, and to understand that others have beliefs, desires, intentions, and perspectives that are different from our own. Um, it's, it is kind of philosophy of mind. So the same thing could be said about creatures, about uh, monkeys, mm -hmm. even. You know, and it's even been determined that rodents probably understand what empathy actually is. Uh, so mind is a much bigger concept in looking at this whole perspective. I think you have to, I mean, monkeys are like, I'd say one of the primary proponents in research of theory of mind. There's these uh, two scientists, uh, one's a biologist, one's a psychologist, their names are uh, Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seyfarth, and they are both huge in the field of primatology, and they are both at the forefront of theory of mind. I mean, this is kind of their brainchild in a funny way, but they studied a lot of vervet monkeys in this theory of mind study that they've done, as well as baboons, and rats have well, as well have been studied, dolphins have been studied, and I could give you a ton of different interesting anecdotes, because there's yeah, a lot yeah. of great books out there that talk about theory of mind. Um, and it's becoming a much hotter topic. I'd say that with the monkeys, one of the most interesting things is their ability to deceive one another. I mean, yeah, they have language, that's cool. You can make the sound that they make and they can respond to you, right. you know? That's cool, that's like, okay, but deception. I, I spoke with one of the really? volunteers at the Vervet Monkey Foundation, yeah, this guy yeah. named Matt, and he's been studying and is such a fan of theory of mind. I mean, this dude is so knowledgeable. He lives in the UK, and he lived at the Vervet Monkey Foundation for two years. But he was telling me basically there's this process that the monkeys have to go through. They have to deworm the monkeys because when the monkeys live in these um, enclosures, they don't get to travel around as much as they would. So of course, any animal in captivity is going to get worms, which is like another aspect of like why we want to make the forest so that these monkeys can right. be out there and traveling right. and not have to worry about these things and people don't have to worry about these things. But when you deworm these monkeys, you hide the deworming medicine within what is called pap or mealy meal, or you put it in a banana. Mealy meal is just this like um, oat that you can form into like a ball of mush that's like pretty firm. It's really traditional South African food. Um, but you put the deworming into the mealy meal and you give it to the monkey and the monkey eats it. But because of the monkey's ranking system, because of the fact that each monkey has a place in a social hierarchy where there's monkeys above them, there's monkeys below them, and if that, like, because of that, the monkey has to do deception. It has to be deceptive for the other monkeys. Because these monkeys Are they into politics? <laughs> the food. They'll see the tree. Yeah, yeah. And if it's a higher ranking monkey and it sees a banana being given to a lower ranking monkey, that upper ranking monkey's gonna be like, no way, are you kidding me? That's my treat and it's gonna run over and the lower ranker's gonna know it's gonna turn into a fight. So it'll run off, it's like, screw this, I'm not gonna even participate. Wow. And it'll give up that treat. And that doesn't do anything because the point of the treat is not a treat, it's deworming. You don't wanna keep giving the same high ranking monkey the deworming every, every time you try and feed it to another one. So yeah. what these vervets do that are low rankers is they deceive. They go, okay, here we go. Volunteer walks up, volunteer slightly shows the deworming food out of their pocket and then hides it again. Monkey sees the deworming food, looks around, notices the higher ranking monkey's positions, and then immediately the lower ranking monkey gets interested in something else. And it's just like, oh, look at that over there, look at that nice, nice bird. And it just starts wandering huh. off in another direction. Interesting. Oh, look at this leaf. And then it'll pick up a stick. Wow. I've never seen such an interesting stick. And in the meantime, the volunteers followed the monkey over to this other secluded area, far from the higher ranking monkeys, 
and the higher rankers have no idea what's going on. They're like, oh, stupid monkey, he's interested in a stick right now. Like, I've got better things to forage for. Meanwhile, the volunteer gives this seemingly stupid monkey a treat filled with his deworming, and there was no conflict, nothing happened, Interesting. everything was fine, the monkey got what it wanted. So the whole point of that is this monkey is aware that these other monkeys have dominance or subordinance within its family structure, within its societal yeah. structure. It understands the dominance and the subordinance. And so it has to act accordingly to the dominance of the subordinates. I mean, you can associate that with like being in a schoolyard and if there's like someone who's a bully that's a kid that's stronger and bigger than you and wants to take your food, and if he sees you have something awesome that he loves, he's gonna take that food from you because he can. So if you don't wanna have that food taken, you have to come up with some method in order to get yourself out of that situation. Interesting. And so that alone is like, okay, look, these things are thinking about themselves, their own wants and desires. They're thinking about what someone else is offering them and the fact that they want that thing. And then they're thinking about how everyone else around them relates. And then they're thinking about their surroundings. And they're saying, well, if I go over here and I do something like this, they won't pay attention to me and I'll get what I want without them knowing. Monkey. I'm here with Jimmy Dore. Jimmy, what are you thankful for? What am I thankful for? Medical marijuana. That's what I'm thankful for. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are always, uh, always asking me to get the marijuana because I have my medical. And I'm like, why don't you get your own license? And they all say the same thing. They all say, I'm afraid if I do, my name will end up on some kind of a list. Yeah, it ends up on a list of people who can buy pot. It's a good list. Yes. <laughs> Joining us here in the studio is Michael James Casey. He's an actor, writer, and filmmaker. His current documentary film project is called Hearing Voices, How Radio Changed America and America Changed Radio. Pleasure to be here on the Now Man Show. Larry, I'm a burglar, and uh, I'm inside a house. They're asleep, but I gotta wait till I'm sure they're asleep, and then I'm gonna rob them. I said, well, why do you call me? He says, well, you're very big with burglars because burglary is a lonely job. It was live. Live at that moment. No five second delay. Run, run. The Philistines are coming. In the Bible, the Philistines are the big giants. And on live radio, I said, run, run. The Philippines are coming. Change over from pop, uh, a rhythm and blues, into what was termed originally by Alan Freed rock and roll. There had never been a sound like Elvis Presley on the radio before. The past is gone, the future is yet to come, it's now, right now. The present is here, the future is near, but it's right now, you know. Being with you makes the body complete, so keep the body moving and ensure you have your feet. At the end of the night, when all is said and done, I wanna know I did the right thing and had a 